Welcome along to this very special edition of Film Talk. I'm Richard Edwards, and in this programme, we're going to be celebrating the wonderful life and career of our very dear friend, actor Derek Foltz. For many people, Derek would be Mr. Derek from Basil Brush in the 1960s, or Bernard Woolley in Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister from the 1980s, or for a more recent generation, he'd be Oscar Blayton in ITV's long running series Heartbeat. But Derek would say people would assume he'd only ever done three jobs, having worked, you know, Basil Brush, Yes Minister, and Heartbeat. But actually, his career, and if you read his autobiography, you will see he had this incredible career after he graduated from RADA, working in theatre, in feature film, and on television. And it's something that he covered in his autobiography, A Part Worth Playing, a fantastic book, co written, it seems, by his good friend and novelist, Michael Sellers. And Derek introduced us to Michael while sitting in the kitchen. We were recording an interview for At Home with Derek Folds, a documentary, a feature length documentary we made with him. And he introduced us to Michael. And effectively, Derek interviewed Michael sitting in the kitchen talking about putting together a part worth playing. This is my uh, biography. It was certainly uh, a labour of love, and it wouldn't have happened without my dear friend who is sitting next to me, uh, Michael Sellers. And if you get a copy, you'll see that his name here is in very, very small <laughs> print. Yes, yes, I can see it. <laughs> and, the, and you don't have a, you don't have a photograph on the, so that's me again, isn't okay. it? But in, in many ways, I appear on every page, don't I? How does that work? Well, through the writing, of course. Well, did you, how uh, much uh, of this book did you write? Well, actually, was, well, page 13. Yes. I wrote a bit on there. Yes. And that came out, no, I'm not in there either. No, you're not in no, there. No, 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 there's no picture. Can I say, it. it's mainly me, isn't it, the book? It, it, it is mostly about you. It could be, but, uh, there's really no need to have I have to tell, it. I have to say that I, this would never, ever have happened. Well, I, I think I've got to disagree a bit, because Why? you were thinking about it. No, I bit. told you, you are a novelist, and I told you that I'm not a writer. No, but you're you great. kept saying to me, why don't you write your book? And I said, I can't write. You've got such a good memory, Derek. But you, you did start it before I became involved. You wrote one page, if you remember. Oh. It took a long time to write that one page. What was it? Can you remember what it was? No, I never actually saw it, but it, eventually it was scrapped. But then you talked about the possible title for it before you yes. got in. Well, we had four. Well, the, the one your mother thought of. That was, yeah, that, that, was, that was a uh, goodie. That was uh, just one of, no, just one of those things. Why, I've forgotten why she said that. Well, because when I went up for these uh, parts, yes. and Michael Crawford and John Hurt used to get the jobs, and I used to go home and said, I didn't get it, Mum. And she would always say, it's just one of those things. Bless her. And we never called it that, did we? No. Now, you, you... Came up with that title because of your first wedding. <laughs> if a, um, well, what do you well, mean, well, first well, wedding? Well, wedding? How many have I had? Uh, 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 it's in the book. Uh, <laughs> but when you were when you were, uh, I think driving to the the church. Oh yes, when I was you were driving. Best man. Yeah. You were talking about, and someone, uh, someone said it's like being in a play, and you said. And I said. I hope it's a part worth playing. Zoom. Derek had this amazing house in the West Country. He lived just outside Bath. The house has been sold now. Unfortunately, he passed away in January 2020. And just as a sort of mark of this person, one of the things he could do, and one of the things he was most proud of was the fact that he could walk through his garden to his local pub. He was a very sociable guy. He got on with just about anybody he spoke to. And he loved going to the local pub and mixing with people from the village and just chatting and having a conversation with friends. To that extent that in his will, he left some money to buy drinks and have a bit of a party at the pub after he'd gone to kind of say thank you to his friends for their friendship through his life. It was a beautiful house and he did show us around in At Home with Derek Folds. We looked at his kitchen with Michael Sellers. We looked at all the theatre posters he had lined up in his hall, the Hall of Shame, as his sons would describe it. And he took us on a guided tour of his office where there were photographs, letters, certificates, a whole host of memorabilia from his very long career in show business. 
So uh, we'll come into my office. Um, there's a, this is a, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Uh, my honours diploma, so I'm pretty chuffed with that. I treasure these letters from Alec Guinness and from Peter Cushing. And uh, I just uh, read them occasionally and think, wasn't I lucky to meet them both? Anna Massey, she's gone. <laughs> There's my Hamlet. Not a lot of people know I played Hamlet. <laughs> this is The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner with dear Tom Courtney, John Thor, Jimmy Bolam, and me trying to get into the act there. Run for your wife. There are the boys of Heartbeat. And over here, we join the Navy with the wonderful Wendy Toy, who directed, and Jeremy Lloyd, Dinsdale Landon, and myself as the three midshipmen. Ten weeks of utter joy that was with the wonderful Kenny Moore. And over here is my dear friend, Diana Hodinot, who played Jim Hacker's wife in Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. She's a great, great friend and a, a delight to know, and God bless her, she's, she's terrific. Derek only worked with Peter Cushing the once, I think it was in 1967 for Frankenstein Created Woman, which was filmed down at Bray Studios, a shoot that was six weeks, but he couldn't wait to get to work every day to be on set with the wonderful Peter Cushing. It was an experience that lasted with him throughout his whole career. And in fact, 20 years later, he received a fan letter of all things from Peter praising Derek on the quality of his acting and also the work he was doing in what was then the Minister series, Yes Minister, Yes Prime Minister. But for Derek, those memories of working with Peter were incredible. He just found him so professional, such a wonderful personality, such a gentle man, the gentle man of horror to be working with. And it was something that lasted with him throughout his whole life. There I was on the set, standing next to the great man. I was totally in awe, I thought. I really don't believe this, that I'm actually standing on a set, you know, with Peter Cushing and, and he looked so, so frightening. He had this face that was, looked so evil and he was the complete opposite. He was the most gentle man. Twenty years later, I got a letter from him. I couldn't believe it. It was a fan letter. <laughs> and he said, uh, I hope you don't mind me calling you Derek, because we have met. But he became a great fan of, of Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. And uh, he complimented me on my performance. And, and I've got that letter uh, in my office on the wall. And uh, I treasure it. And the fact that Peter Cushing wrote me a fan letter. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't get over it. And I look at it most days and say, Peter, it was a pleasure and a privilege and an honour to be with you for those six weeks. Well, I mean, in the film industry, um, just the name Peter Cushing is uh, is iconic and. He is a legend, and anyone who goes back into the archives and see, sees what Peter achieved as an actor, and as you say, his body of work is, is phenomenal, and he will live forever. He'll always be uh, connected with Hammer Horror, and he'll always be Baron Frankenstein, really, but... Uh, his other work, you know, whatever Peter did, was touched with class and a bit of genius. There is no one like Peter and that face and that voice together. And uh, he was a joy. 
Derek says that people often assume he's only ever done three jobs. Uh, Mr. Derek in Basil Brush, Bernard Woolley in Yes Minister, and Oscar Blaketon in ITV's Heartbeat. But his career is so much more diverse than that, appearing in the West End 14, 16 times, something like that, uh, in many, many feature films, and worked with some of our biggest names on stage and on screen. He started out in theatre, and I think loved being on the theatre, and just a couple of years before he passed away, had returned to the theatre for the first time in nearly 20 years. It was something that was very close to his heart, and he had very fond memories of working with wonderful people, Robert Morley, Alistair Sim, and many, many others. He just loved being on stage. This is what my son's called the Shrine, or the Rogues Gallery. This, uh, this is a play I did in uh, uh, A Private Matter with Alistair Sim. Mind you, his, uh, his name is Feeding. Yeah. Are these are the plays, uh, some of the plays I did in Worthing. How Are You, Johnny, with Ian McShane, which we took into the West End. This play I did in London with Lawrence Harvey, Rupert Davis. Lawrence was wonderful. And uh, he took me out to Monte Carlo uh, for a holiday, and I met... He introduced me to Frank Sinatra. So I, I shook hands with Frank Sinatra, all because of knowing Lawrence Harvey. He died when he was 46. Terrible. Derek had been on the big screen on many occasions, having appeared with Jenny Agutter and Anthony Quayle in East of Sudan, but also with Dirk Bogart in a couple of films, one of the Doctoring films, and also Hot Enough for June. And it was a time that he really loved, and he really enjoyed working with Dirk Bogart, and in particular this film, Hot Enough for June. He had some very fond memories of working in that, and in fact how he got the gig in the first place. You know, working with these people, Kenneth Moore, generous, kind, wonderful man, Dirk Bogard was so kind to me. We did a doctor in film, a doctor in distress, and then he took me out to uh, Florence for a holiday. I was doing a play in Worthing, and the stage doorman said, Derek, yeah, Dirk Bogard on the phone. I said, what? <laughs> so I went... <laughs> I said, hello. He said, it's Dirk. I said, hey. he said, what are you doing? Do you want to come to Florence for a holiday? I said, what? He said, there's a scene I have to do in this film. You just uh, lie by a swimming pool and I burn your hand and I take your, you know, clothes tag and uh, that's all you have to do. I said, do I say anything? He said, no. He said, you could do it. Oh, <laughs> and if you ever see that film, it's never off. And people rang me up and said, you didn't do much in that, did you? And it was Dirk and Betty Box who took me out for a holiday. Yeah, I love Dirk. In 1980, Anthony Jay and Jonathan Lynn created Yes Minister, a political satire, a sitcom around politics that was very, very unique. It was groundbreaking for its time. It starred Nigel Hawthorne, Paul Eddington, Diana Hodinot, and of course, Derek Folds as Bernard Woolley. It's a role he got purely by chance, and he remembered getting that casting after bumping into Jonathan Lynn at his agent's office. I remember one day going into my agent's office and, and coming out was Jonathan Lynn. Now, I knew John o. Lynn as, a, as an actor, and I said, hello, Jonathan, how are you? And he said, very well, Derek, nice to see you. And uh, I said, is, is he on his own in there? He said, yes, he's waiting for you. <laughs> my agent. So I went in and I said, what's he doing here? What's Jonathan doing here? And uh, my agent then was David White. And uh, he said, oh, he's casting a new series. I said, oh, is there anything for me in it as you do? He said, no, there's nothing for you. I said, oh, well. Anyway, I went back home and uh, the phone rang. And David said, uh, well, Jonathan's just been on the phone and he saw you in the office and he said there may be a part for you in this new series and I said oh well, what is it he said it's called Yes Minister and I said is it about vicars thinking it might be a religious comedy <laughs> with Derek Nemo in it and uh, he said no it's about politics I said what 
a sitcom about politics. He said, we're going to send you a script. And he sent me the script, and I, I loved it. I thought this was different and exciting, and I said to my agent, I'd love to do it. And that's how I got the part. We did the pilot in 1979, but they had to wait for a year because of the election. We didn't know who was going to get in. So the, the writers, you know, Jonathan and uh, uh, Tony J, they had to wait to see. And then we started the series in, in 1980, and uh, we had seven glorious years. I wish we were doing it now. Can you imagine doing Yes Minister now? I guess for many people, we would assume that working with a puppet puppet of a of a fox basil brush might not be the most challenging of acting work but it was something that Derek said was very unique for him it was it was an experience working with Ivan uh, Ivan Owen who operated basil brush it was a second series that very nearly he chose not to do but decided to go ahead because he needed the money he had a young family and it was an experience doing that second series that really transformed him and helped Derek understand who he was as an actor and to learn how to be me. Something actors find very difficult to do, but with Basil Brush, Derek was able to achieve it. I'm a classically trained actor. What am I doing with my, with my arm around a bit of fur looking into a couple of buttons? Uh, it was different. I found it quite difficult to get to know me because uh, most actors don't know who they are. They, they like to hide behind, you know, different people, different characters. I gradually found a way of doing it. And I think it was the second series that I very nearly didn't do when they asked me to do another series. But I had two small boys and, and they offered me a bit more money. And I did enjoy working with Ivan Owen, who looked after Basil and lovely George Martin who wrote these uh, scripts and and I thought okay I'll do a second series and and it was that series that kind of something extraordinary happened that one day I was laughing with Basil and and I looked at him and the buttons became eyes and I put my arm around him and the fur became a tail and I fell in love with Basil. He became my best mate and we went on to do eight series and two Royal Command performances and, uh, and when I left I, I missed him. Derek joined the cast for ITV's Heartbeat in 1992 and thought perhaps it might run for one season. But in fact, it ran for 372 episodes, 18 seasons over 18 years, and finishing in 2010. And Derek was in every single episode. He loved Yorkshire, he loved the cast, he loved the crew. He said they became a kind of family to him. And it's, I think it's typical with Derek. He put his heart and soul into the whole series. It's still being shown around the world. It's still being shown on ITV3 here in the UK. And that's what, 12, 13 years after the series finished. You know, 18 years, I think it needed a revamp. I think it had changed so much and I think it could have gone on, but I, I uh, you know, the cast changes and it became a kind of guest driven show. And, but it was still watched by 7 million. And I think it could have gone on, but uh, it probably was the right time to end it. And people still, I still get letters and it's repeated on ITV3 and, and people still love it. Um, I think I stayed because I enjoyed the, enjoyed the money. <laughs> I enjoyed the security, but I, I got to love the crew. It became, we became a kind of family and I loved Yorkshire and the location and it was just a great job to have. A few years after Derek finished on Heartbeat, he decided to write his autobiography with his good friend novelist Michael Sellers and they put together Derek Fold's A Part Worth Playing and I'm absolutely delighted 
that Derek has very kindly dedicated my copy, which is a wonderful, wonderful keepsake to have on the bookshelf. It tells his incredible story in show business from growing up in Berkhamsted, the wonderful contribution his mother made to getting him started in life and looking after him through his determination to become an actor and getting through RADA, but also the love and affection that he had for family, for friends, and the incredible diversity of work that he did on stage, on film and on television. As a jobbing actor, I've been very lucky. We never give up. No. Just the phone stops ringing. Yeah. Actors don't retire, do they? They don't retire, no. They don't give up the business. The business sometimes gives you up, but not, not yet. yet. Not yet. But the one thing I think that Derek truly loved above all else was theatre. And that's why, a little while after he'd written his autobiography, he chose to go back on stage, I think for the first time in roughly 20 years, with his very good friend Donald Douglas in a one-act play. They did it in France, where Donald was living. And to go back on stage in your 80s, for the first time in 20 years, must have been a very nerve-wracking experience. Well, when I finished the book, I really didn't think I would work. You did a casualty. Oh, I did a casualty. You did? And then I did um, an antiques road trip, didn't you, I? You did. But then I got this offer of from my dear friend Donald Douglas, who's an actor and runs a theatre in France, would I go back on stage? And I haven't been back on stage for 16 years. And I thought, uh, should I do this? Uh, can I do it? Can I remember it? There was only two people in it. Helen came to France with me and uh, Donald and I rehearsed for three days and then we did two sell-out performances and I really would like to do it again. No chance of that coming to the UK? Well, no, no, there, there might be. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're talking about it. I think Derek leaves a tremendous legacy in our popular culture. His career on stage in the West End and other theatres around the UK and overseas and on Broadway uh, is second to none. He was very accomplished as an actor on television, as we know, Yes Minister, Heartbeat, Basil Brush, but so many other roles too, and also on the big screen in many, many feature films as well. His first love, theatre, I'm sure, which is why he returned to the stage with Donald Douglas very much later in life, in his 80s. He's left a very good account of his career in his book, A Part Worth Playing, co-written with Michael Sellers. A great read. Do read it if you get the chance. A talented actor for sure, absolutely. He was in great series on the TV, some superb feature films. His work is there for people to see, to enjoy, and that lasting legacy to popular culture will endure because of that. But for me, the most enduring memory that I have of Derek is trying to record an interview. We'd be sitting on the sofa, trying to ask questions. We'd end up just laughing about so many different things. And it was a nightmare trying to record an interview because we just have to keep stopping because we, we ended up just laughing so much. And if that's your lasting legacy, laughter and enjoyment and bringing happiness into people's lives, then what more can you ask for? Derek Foltz our dear friend who we lost in 2020. I think in my career, what I remember most are the wonderful actors and people that I've worked with. Okay, there are parts you've played and, and jobs you've had that you wish you hadn't, and parts you've played that you've been very proud of. But mm. basically, looking back, it's the... It's the privilege and, and the honour of working with, you know, just great actors and wonderful people like Alistair Sim and Alec Guinness and Kenneth Moore, Lawrence Harvey, Dirk Bogard, and of course, the great Peter. And uh, you, you don't forget the times you spent with these wonderful people. And uh, even as a transvestite with uh, Robert well, Morley. No, 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 well, well. That's Robert, a different story. No, Robert wrote this play. I laugh every time I think about it. He wrote this play called <laughs> The Picture of Innocence, it was called. It was about three transvestites. He was a high court judge. I was his secretary. Uh, Kenneth Griffith was his accountant. 
and we had this flat in Mayfair where we used to meet and dress up and uh, and then we realized that our wives didn't know and we were being blackmailed it's a very good idea <laughs> And don't make me laugh because no. I'll cough. Uh, and uh, mm. so in the first act, I was Dorothy L'Amour. <laughs> in the second act, I was Betty Grable. Yeah, I if you can remember, see that. you remember her? I can see that, yeah. And uh, when I introduced myself as Betty Grable to my wife, uh, who play, was played by Susie Blake, I'll never, ever, ever forget it. But the icing on the cake was when Robert came in after at the end of the first act, in a ball gown and a tiara. And it's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my whole career. And every night I laughed. And, and Robert used to say, you t Derek, don't you take anything seriously? You know, he goes, I just love the man. He was uh, full of joie de vivre and, mm. uh, and fun and generosity. And, uh, the great Robert Morley, yeah, that was, that was another one. Links to work we've done that's on YouTube and other things that are in other places are down below. Do check those out and check out what a great guy Derek Foltz was. It's been great to sit here and reminisce about our good friend and also to look back at some of those most uh, entertaining moments from the documentaries and interviews we've recorded over the years. He was a great friend, a great actor. What more can you say? The wonderful Derek Foltz. When I became an actor, my mother said, I would like, I'd like three things to happen to you. And I said, what are they, Mum? She said, I'd love to see your name in lights. And she did. And I said, what's next? She said, I really would love to see you on the front cover of Radio Times. And she did. And I said, what's next? And she said, I hope I'm alive when they do your This Is Your Life. And I said, Mum, that will never happen. But in 1993, while I was doing Heartbeat, it, it did happen. And Michael Aspel came in with a big red book. And, and afterwards, uh, I said to Mum, I said, right, they're your three wishes. And she looked at me and she said, I can go now. And that was something really, you know, got to me. But she did die a year later. And she was the most fantastic woman and a wonderful mum. Always, always in my heart.